Thanks, Ashley. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Evan Bradley, and I'm the Chief Financial Officer for Campbell Property Management, one of the five owners of the company, and I'm also a licensed CAM. I work very closely with some of our largest clients on the major issues facing their associations, including budgeting, reserves, and financing projects. For those of you not as familiar with Campbell, we've been in business since 1953 and manage over 400 HOA and condo association clients between Dade and St. Lucie counties here in South Florida. Joining us today is Will Simons of Association Reserves. We've had the pleasure of working with Will and his firm for many years, and the reserve start studies are instrumental in helping us craft proper budgets and developing plans for our association's future. Uh, Will, would you like to say a little bit about yourself and uh, Association Reserves? I've got a, a little bio that I'll do as soon as we start the class. So um, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll get to that in a few minutes here. So just a reminder that this is, uh, <clears throat> this is education today. It is not financial or legal advice. If you have questions, specific questions about your community, uh, do reach out to uh, your own management council or uh, your reserve study provider. And we do encourage you to take advantage of the Q&A, uh, but do try to limit it to questions about the course material. Questions about your individual association are gonna be beyond the scope of our presentation. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Will and uh, his CEU course. Okay, great. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here. Hopefully you guys will see this in just a moment. Uh, can I get a thumbs up, Evan? Do you see Association Reserves logo there? Cool. All good, Will. All right, great. Uh, well, thank you for joining us today, everybody. Uh, yeah, my name is Will Simons. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I'll say hello on camera here for just a moment. I'll turn my camera off during the presentation itself. I uh, want to say thank you to Ashley and Evan and everybody over there at Campbell Property Management. It's always a pleasure to work with you guys. Uh, so thank you for this opportunity to, to put this class on today. Uh, today's class is called Fundamentals of Reserves. Uh, it should run about maybe 45, 50 minutes or so, uh, and then we'll have time for that Q&A. So as the class goes on, please feel free to ask any questions that you have uh, using that Q&A button down at the bottom of the taskbar. Uh, I think we should have time to get through all those at the end of the class, uh, but in the event that we run out of time, uh, I will have my email address up on screen, so feel free to uh, send me any follow-up questions that, uh, that we don't get to today. Just a quick notice, uh, this happened once this year, so I'll just give a quick warning. I was in the middle of teaching a class and the internet service in my building died. Uh, so in the event we have any technical difficulties, if my... Um, screen freezes up. If you can't hear me, uh, bear with me. I will log back out and back in as soon as we can. Uh, so hopefully that's not an issue, but just because it happened once, I feel like I got to put that out there. So fingers crossed for no technical difficulties today. Uh, one more reminder, I will be teaching a second class, uh, which is coming up next week. That'll be on Tuesday the 20th. Uh, that class is called Reserve Funding Methodologies. And that's gonna be a great follow-up to today's class. Uh, it'll build on some of the core concepts that we introduced today. So I highly encourage everybody to register and to join us for that one as well. Um, I, you know, I'm assuming that will be recorded as well. So if you can't make it, that's okay, but uh, that's gonna be a lot of great content as well. So uh, thanks for joining. I'll switch my camera off and we will get started here in just a moment. Okay, so again, welcome to Fundamentals of Reserves. Today's class is approved for one hour of continuing education credit in either the insurance and financial management section or as an elective. If you haven't already provided us with your first name, last name, and CAM license number, please be sure to do so. I think everybody did that as part of the registration process. Um, but if you're not sure, if you wanna just double check, feel free to email that to us as well. Uh, otherwise, we won't be able to get you credit for today's class for all you managers out there. Uh, with that said, I don't want to give the impression that this course is only for managers. All of you board members, committee members, residents, anybody else who's on the line today, everyone's going to learn a great deal about reserve budgeting, planning, uh, and hopefully come away better prepared to lead and serve the communities that you work with. Uh, as Ashley mentioned, we'll be providing copies of the slides, a link to the recording, um, so don't feel like you've got to frantically take notes today. Um, just sort of take it all in. Feel free, again, to ask questions as we go along. But if you miss anything, uh, this will all be recorded and, and everybody get a chance to, uh, to see this again. Okay, I'll take a moment just to introduce myself and our company in a little more detail. Uh, my name, again, is Will Simons. I'm the president of the Florida Office for Association Reserves. 
I've been with the company since 2008. I've spent most of my career in Florida. We've had clients in Florida going back to the early 90s. Uh, the company itself was established in uh, 1986, actually. The RS after my name stands for Reserve Specialist, which is an industry specific credential that's only awarded to people who have demonstrated their experience and expertise in preparing reserve studies. That designation is awarded by the Community Associations Institute or CAI. And there's actually only been uh, only a, a few hundred people to ever earn that credential going back to, uh, I think it was 1998 when they first established the, the national standards for our industry. I've lived in both condos and HOAs. I spent about six years serving as the treasurer of my own community in South Florida. We had a budget there of over a million dollars, uh, about 635 home community. Uh, the reason I feel that's interesting to point out is because I know what it's like to be on the other side of the table. You know, I've worked with the volunteers, with the board members, the committees, the folks out there who are taking the responsibility of really managing their associations internally, which as we all know, can represent hundreds of people and many millions of dollars worth of property value. Uh, our company is the oldest and largest reserve study provider in the United States. We've completed tens of thousands of reserve studies for all different property types all around the world. We've got offices from coast to coast and we have more credentialed reserve specialists on staff than any other company. The majority of the work that we do is for community associations, which of course includes all types of condos, HOAs, timeshares, and other residential communities. But we also have a great deal of experience with other property types, things like office buildings, hotels, resorts, worship facilities, and others. Um, one thing I always like to point out is that our only job as a company is preparing reserve studies. Okay, so we are not an engineering firm, we're not an accounting firm but rather we're a very specialized consulting firm, which is focused on doing one thing really well, and that is to guide our clients towards a successful financial future. The way that we do that is by preparing accurate and reliable reserve studies that help those clients to forecast and budget for major projects. So we feel that if we do our job well and our clients follow the plans that we help them to design, then hopefully we're able to reduce the risk of special assessments and bank loans and other types of financial distress. Okay, so uh, if you'd like any additional information, you <clears throat> excuse me, visit our website <clears throat> at reservestudy.com. <clears throat> Joking on my coffee here. <clears throat> <clears throat> or please <clears throat> feel free to email me, and my email address will be up on the screen <clears throat> at the end of the class. That's wsimons at reservestudy.com. <clears throat> okay, so here's what we're going to cover today. The course really just has these two sections. <clears throat> we'll spend a little bit of time in the beginning with this kind of basic introductory question, just what are reserves in the first place? <clears throat> we'll then spend the majority of the class talking about reserve studies and how those documents are actually used by community associations to make sure that they're on the right track with regard to long-term planning. Um, we're going to take a, you know, a couple of detours and we can talk about some examples of communities that we're not adequately funding. Um, I did remove some slides from this course. Um, if anybody has taken this course before, you may remember that we, we usually do this kind of uh, what we call hall of shame where we have these photos that we've taken during inspections of properties really to kind of you know, illustrate what can go wrong when associations don't have healthy reserve funds. Uh, made the choice to remove those slides for today's class and maybe for the foreseeable future, just in light of uh, what's happened in Surfside recently. Um, but I think, you know, it doesn't take um, a tragedy like that to really illustrate that uh, reserve funding is absolutely vital for every community association out there. So uh, we'll talk about that in, in more detail and uh, happy to engage in the Q&A if anybody has specific questions there. So please take notes as we go along and uh, we'll get started. Okay, uh, <laughs> I do like to include this particular slide in every presentation that I give because I do think that this illustrates a very common reaction uh, or maybe a mindset when it comes to long-term planning. So what we see out there and what you may have seen amongst your community members is this reluctance to embrace the responsibility that goes along with long-term planning. 
I think this guy here represents a typical attitude that we see quite often actually when it comes to budgeting for reserves and thinking long term. So if you look at this guy, obviously he's got his eyes closed, fingers crossed, kind of this distressed, pained look on his face. And if there's one message that I want you all to remember today, you know, it's this picture that's worth a thousand words. We all need to go out there to the communities that we work with and to help them get over, get around this mindset. Okay, we, we have responsibility, whether you're a professional in the field, whether you're a volunteer working in your association, to educate the people around us, right? Don't let excuses get in the way. Let's all collectively help those people out there uh, and help them to make good decisions for themselves. <coughs> okay. So again, we'll start with this relatively basic sounding question, what are reserves? <clears throat> for those who may have been in this field for a while, uh, this slide's gonna be fairly elementary. Uh, so if you're newer to the profession or if you're not used to drafting budgets, um, I think those of you out there might get a, a little bit more benefit here. We're gonna spend just a couple of minutes talking about the two main aspects of any given association's budget. So basically we have a, a budget each year that's categorized into two main sections. You've got your operating fund and your reserve fund. First, we'll talk about the operating fund. Now that money is essentially there for the routine costs of what I always call running the business of the association. So these are going to be the daily, weekly, monthly types of expenses for things like utilities, insurance, payroll, preventive maintenance, so on and so forth. If you think in personal terms, you can think of the operating account of an association sort of like an individual's checking account. Okay, Operating funds are unrestricted, which means they can be spent on any bill that the association has to pay. And the money is typically going to be spent in the same year that it's collected. Okay, so. What that means is that if you've designed a good budget, you really shouldn't have any significant surplus or deficit at the end of the year. Uh, the idea is that you will spend all of the money that you collect within a given fiscal year during that same year. Okay, so that's that's the operating side of things. On the other hand, we've got a reserve account or accounts, and those are there for the long-term expenses that the association will have to pay for. Uh, some of those expenses may not occur for five, 10, maybe 25 years at a time, but when they do occur, those will typically be some of the biggest bills the association will ever have to pay. Okay, so reserve money is typically used for things like roof replacements, painting and waterproofing, pavement, elevators, many other projects that we'll talk about later on. Uh, but for now, I just want to focus on the differences here. So, you know, some of the other differences between operating and reserve money is that reserve funds are restricted, meaning once you put a dollar into a reserve account, it can only be spent on specific things, not any generic you know, project or you know, an insurance bill. Uh, another difference, of course, is that in contrast to the operating fund, reserve money will accumulate, sometimes over many, many years, building up a account balance that is held on hand until it needs to be spent for its intended purpose. So going back to that kind of personal finance analogy, uh, the reserve account functions more like a savings account would for an individual. Okay, on this slide here, I've got a fairly short excerpt from Florida statutes. Uh, specifically, this is a section of statute 718. We call this the condo statute. And what I've highlighted in red here is the portion of the text that talks about what associations must be reserving for. So if you look at that red section, uh, the statute requires that condo associations reserve for three things in particular. And then at the end, they add in a sort of general definition. So the three things that they name specifically are roofs, painting, and paving. And then the general definition or general criteria at the end is, and for any other item with a replacement cost greater than $10,000. Now, if anybody out there is wondering, why did they pick $10,000? Why is that the dollar amount? I've been teaching this class for, I guess, about 10 years now. And I've asked this question in front of many different audiences, talked to lots of CPAs, and nobody has ever really given a clear, concrete answer as to why that number is $10,000. In other words, why is it not $1,000 or $25,000? As far as I can tell, nobody really knows. Uh, my guess is that way back when they wrote the statute, they came up with a number that sounded high and said, you know, let's go with that. That's, that should be significant. That should be a good ballpark number. 
But the point is that the $10,000 number is actually totally arbitrary, okay? For, for many associations out there, if not most associations, that number is probably much too high of a threshold to set. Uh, we're gonna talk about this later in the class, but a more appropriate way to look at that dollar amount should be in terms of, you know, what is financially significant to my association? And oftentimes that, that number is gonna be a much lower dollar amount. On this slide here, I've got a portion of the statute that pertains to HOAs. Uh, the HOA statute 720 actually has even less to say about what you should be reserving for in a community association. So unlike the condo statute, there is no specific checklist of items that need to be included. Instead, pretty much the only guidance you get is that, hey, there are certain things that your association is responsible for. And if you don't have reserves, that could result in a special assessment. Okay. Now, the good news here is that there's actually a much more realistic, much more thorough way to go about defining what any association should be including in its reserve schedule. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. For now, I just want to kind of plant this sort of basic idea in your minds, the basic definition of reserve funding. Uh, that's money that's there for an association to save over a long period of time for major repair and replacement projects. Now, notice what I didn't say, okay? I didn't say that you could spend your reserve money on capital improvements, on paying a really high insurance deductible, right? Or for really any other purpose. Um, technically speaking, that is permissible if you get all your owners to, uh, to vote and agree to use the reserve money for a non-scheduled purpose. But anytime that's done, you're really taking money away from the things that it was originally intended for. So you kind of, uh, you know, play a little bit of a shell game with yourself. More than likely, it's gonna end up resulting in some kind of loan or special assessment uh, for the thing that is now in a deficit situation. So just a quick example here. Let's say that you've got an association that does not have a playground, but all of the residents in the community really, really wanna put one in. And that might be a perfectly smart, worthwhile thing to do but you can't use reserve money for that. That's adding a new element to the association. And that would have never been considered in any of your prior year reserve budgets. So any prior reserve contributions never considered that additional cost that you're now putting into the model. Uh, so again, in reality, it might be a great thing to do, but that initial expenditure, the creation of that playground would have to be paid for by some other means, you know, uh, a capital fund or a special assessment or a surplus from operating, uh, just not reserve money. However, once the playground is in place, then absolutely the association should start reserving for future long-term replacement cycles for fencing and equipment and fall surfaces and so forth. Uh, but it's just that initial cost that would be treated as a capital improvement and not eligible for reserve funding. Okay, that's the end of our first section. Uh, we're gonna switch gears now. This will be the kind of the heart of the class talking about reserve studies and how these are used by communities to uh, aid in their annual budget process. First, I, I wanna just establish the definition of a reserve study, which comes from National Reserve Study Standards. These standards have been in place now for uh, over 20 years. Again, you know, 1998 was when they were first adopted. And the standards identify a reserve study as a tool or really a document um, that does a couple of things for you. First, it identifies the current status of the reserve fund. And then secondly, it provides a funding plan that gives you guidance about how to deal with your future expenditures. Now, uh, notice what I didn't say, okay? A reserve study is not an insurance appraisal. It's not a turnover study. It's not an engineering report. Um, it's a very particular document that contains some very specific content regarding the physical and financial elements of the community. I'm going to go on a quick tangent here just because it's been in the news, obviously, a lot. Um, I'm sure anybody who's been reading up on the Surfside tragedy, uh, you may have noticed that back from, I think it was 2008 to 2010, there was briefly a law on the books in Florida that required that certain properties be inspected. I think it was every five years by a licensed architect or engineer who would have to attest to life expectancies and give opinions on replacement costs for things. Um, that, although it's been kind of characterized as one, that itself is actually not a reserve study. That's like half of a reserve study. Um, 
And we'll talk about that in a moment. But, you know, just because it's been in the news, people talk about there, you know, at one time there was a law that required this sort of financial guidance. And that actually wasn't the case. It was it was sort of the first part of what we do. Um, I'll talk more about, more about that in a moment. But first, um, let me talk you through the three types of reserve studies. So if a community has never had one done before, then it will begin with what's called a full reserve study. So in that level of service, the provider is creating everything totally from scratch, okay? That'll involve a, a thorough site inspection, taking measurements, taking photos, basically gathering up all the raw data that will eventually materialize into a component list for that property. Okay, after there's been that full study done, there are two types of subsequent update studies that can be offered after that. The first type is called an update with a site visit. So in those cases, it's including a new site inspection, but based on the existing component list, which was already established. So in those cases, we're looking for any significant changes in life expectancies, cost estimates, observations of current conditions, taking account of any work that's been done since the prior study was done. There are some states that require these types of updates at specific intervals. Again, Florida is not one of them. But generally speaking, the best practice is to have one done at least about every three years or so. Um, the last type of study is called an update with no site visit, which is exactly what it sounds like. Still a whole new reserve study document, but in this case, instead of conducting a physical inspection of the property, in these cases, the provider will be corresponding with the board of directors, with the property manager, to find out what projects have taken place or what new information is available since the prior study was done. Um, and again, still including a whole new financial analysis, but um, without the virtue of going back to the property again. Two parts to a reserve study. Those are called the physical analysis and the financial analysis. So the physical analysis portion of the study is where somebody will be coming out to do that visual inspection of all the common areas. Everything from the roof, the mechanical rooms, the amenities, the lobby, basically anything and everything that the association is responsible for needs to be evaluated. Uh, this involves, again, taking those measurements, photos, getting model numbers, serial numbers for equipment, basically doing whatever it takes to gather up the raw data, um, which we will then use to determine life expectancies and replacement costs. When we do this physical analysis, we always try to meet with a representative from the association, whether that's a board member or property manager. But the general idea is to try and collaborate, you know, work with the representatives of the property, the people who are live there or working there every day, um, who, you know, much have, probably have a much better understanding of the um, kind of inner workings of the community. So I want to make another point here again, you know, related to current events, um, which is that a reserve study inspection is no substitute for a forensic or structural engineering evaluation. Okay, two totally different things. A, a reserve study is much broader in scope. We're including everything from you know, hallway carpeting and lobby furniture to pool resurfacing. You know, it's a, it's a long-term forecast meant to capture a broad range of projects. Whereas a structural evaluation or inspection is, is laser focused on one aspect of the property. Um, and those will go into much more detail. They'll have a lot more uh, qualifications required to do that type of inspection. Um, and they're very, very important to, to do as we've seen. Um, but the two sort of services are complementary to one another. You know, what we tell our clients is that if you're thinking about doing a reserve study and a structural evaluation, it might be a good idea to do the structural evaluation first, um, just to get some idea as to current conditions and some working numbers as to budget costs and, and what might need to be done there. But you can also do the reserve study first. We always include recommendations for concrete restoration, waterproofing, because these are predictable projects in South Florida. And so we feel that even if it's just a placeholder number to put in for now, let's have something in the model uh, but along with that, give a recommendation to consider that more in-depth evaluation if you have any particular concerns. Um, I'm going to give just some rough ballpark costs only because I, I am anticipating that these may come up in the Q&A. Just for everyone's benefit, um, a reserve study, you know, often runs, let's say, for a very small, very simple property, it might be $3,000. Uh, for a larger property, say a luxury high rise, you might be in the five to $7,000 range. Uh, those are kind of middle of the road numbers. 
just for comparison, we had a client the other day, uh, fairly small, fairly simple building, and the quote they had gotten for a structural evaluation was $35,000. Okay, so a different order of magnitude in terms of cost, um, but again, a very worthwhile, very smart thing to do, and especially to have both of them done so that you can work those financial recommendations, those budget costs into your overall financial model. Okay. So second part of a reserve study is what we call the financial analysis. And this is usually where we're back at the office, crunching numbers, making phone calls, organizing all that raw data that we gathered during the inspection and starting to make some analysis uh, and draw some conclusions. You know, we'll research cost history, when were projects done, compare that information against our experience working with similar properties and start to fill in the gaps, you know, begin to draw some financial conclusions and figure out where this, where this community needs to go. There are three outcomes to a reserve study, which I'll go over here one at a time. First and foremost, kind of the foundation of the reserve study is that component list. And the word component in this context really just means an instance where the association will be spending money. So a reserve component could be a roof replacement project, a swimming pool project, a lobby remodeling, uh, you get the idea. But for, for each component on the list, there are three key pieces of information that need to be determined. First, we determine the useful life of that component. And what I mean by that is its overall lifespan or how long will it be in place from start to finish, either from when it was originally installed or most recently replaced until that will need to be done again. The second estimate is its remaining useful life. Now that number is going to be determined relative to a certain point in time. So for example, let's say you've got a component with a useful life of 10 years, and as of this fiscal year, it's only three years old. In that case, you would say that, again, as of this fiscal year, its remaining useful life should be about seven years. And then lastly, we come up with an estimate for replacement cost. And I've been asked over the years if the word replacement really matters. You know, is that, does it always have to be a wholesale replacement of something? Now, to be clear, you don't always have to be fully replacing something to justify it as a reserve component. You could say upgrade, remodel, modernize, resurface, you know, you, know, you pick the verb, but the idea is that uh, we're focusing on the need to spend some money to keep a component, first of all, in good shape and, and adding value to the community. Okay, at this point, you might be wondering, you know, how do we determine what goes on the list? And I talked earlier about the Florida statutes and what they have to say with respect to reserve budgeting. But right now, I'm going to give you a different approach. Now, most professional reserve study providers will use this four-part test that, again, comes from National Reserve Study Standards. And this test gives us a more open-ended definition of what a reserve component should be. Now, the beauty of the test is that it can be applied to any different type of community. So instead of going into a project with some kind of predetermined checklist, we go in with open eyes, looking for anything on the property that might meet this criteria. And we'll talk through these, these four parts one at a time. The first part is that the component in question has to be the association's responsibility. It's pretty straightforward. So an example of something that might fail that part of the test could be windows and doors in a condo building. Now, I would say at least 99% of the time that the individual unit owners will be responsible for replacement of their own windows and doors, so obviously in those cases, there's no need to include them in the association's funding plan. In another case, you might have an HOA where the roads are maintained by the city or by the county. And then obviously in those cases, there's no need for that HOA to include any funding for road repaving. Okay, the second part of the test is that the component has to have a limited useful life. Now in our world, we don't use the word forever, but if something should last indefinitely, and there's no timeline where, where you would expect to replace it, then it really shouldn't be considered as part of the reserve plan. So as an example, you can think of something like the foundation of a building, right? The conduit inside the walls, uh, those things that should last the life of the property, however long that is, and therefore you're not actually actively funding for their replacement. It's more likely at that point that some developer will come in and knock down the building and build something new than you would ever have to replace those things. The third part of the test is maybe the most complicated, which is that a component has to have a predictable remaining useful life in order for it to be appropriate to include it in the reserve plan. 
Now the key word here is predictable. And to be more specific, what I mean is predictability in terms of scope and frequency, okay? So if you can't reliably predict how much money you'll spend on something or how often, then it's probably not a good idea to handle it through reserves. And I'll give you a, a quick example. Many of our clients, many associations will ask the question if they can include their insurance deductible as part of a reserve plan, right? And they say it's a really big number. We're scared that if we ever have to pay this deductible amount, we would like to list that as a reserve component, be able to tap into our reserve money. Well, our response to that, again, if you think back at those um, at these standards is, well, what should the useful life be in that case? In other words, how often would you have to pay that deductible, which of course nobody knows. That's the whole reason we have insurance in the first place. These expenses come as a surprise. They're as a result of some natural disaster, maybe a fire or flood or hurricane. And to make some arbitrary prediction about how often that might occur is getting, getting away from the purpose of this plan. Now that's not to say we don't recommend that you have some kind of plan in place. After all, it's Florida. There will absolutely be more hurricanes over the years. The problem is that we don't know how much or how often. Um, and you know, we just wouldn't know when to plug that expense into the timeline to know when they'll have to pay that deductible. So in these cases, normally what we tell our clients is that you know, it's a good idea to consider a third type of account for your association. Right, you've got your operating account for those routine expenses. You have your reserve account for all the components that meet this criteria that we're talking about now. But in addition to that, it's probably a good idea to establish some kind of emergency fund, maybe an emergency line of credit or both, which would be available to the community in the event that you do have to pay for that deductible. Again, the problem with listing it as a reserve component is that ultimately you're basing some very specific funding calculations off of an expected timeline of expenses. And if those expenses don't fall in line with the plan, then all the calculations are thrown off, okay? Let's say we assumed a useful life of 10 years for paying your deductible. So we're, we're, we're guessing that we'll get a major hurricane every 10 years, for example. But what happens if you get three storms in a period of five years and you're expecting that your reserve account can fund those costs each time? Well, in reality, what would happen there is that you're more likely to pull money away from your other reserve components that do have a predictable lifespan, which is likely to result in needing special assessments to make up for those shortfalls, which is again, one of the things we're trying to avoid in the first place. Okay, we'll move on from this uh, four part test here in just a moment, but the last criteria here is, does this component represent a significant cost to the association? I showed you earlier the Florida statutory number of $10,000. But again, just remember that's an arbitrary number. In our experience for most associations, that threshold should be much lower. Now, why do we do that? The advantage of doing it that way is that you will then have more components listed in your reserve schedule, which takes the pressure off of the operating budget, which would otherwise have to absorb those costs whenever they came along. So let's just you know pretend we're all managing a little tiny association, small budget, very few number of owners. And let's say there we're considering six projects that have $5,000 cost estimates each. Okay, technically speaking, we would be consistent and, and permissible with the statutes if we left those things out of the reserve plan because individually they are less than $10,000. But if all six of those projects happen to occur around the same time, collectively, that's a total expense of $30,000, which they're just assuming they can squeeze into the operating budget. And you know, as we all know, cash flow is often tight. Uh, they might find themselves in a tough situation if that happened. However, if they had listed them in their reserve plan, then they would have the ability to spend reserve money on those things. And hopefully that would be less disruptive to the community. Um, so point being, there is no one single number that's appropriate for any and all associations. Uh, but in my experience, we usually set that bar, you know, anywhere from like two to $5,000, depending on the size of the community. Okay, on this slide here, I've got a little red bracket at the top, uh, which we've drawn around the top three components, which are the ones, of course, mentioned specifically by the statutes. But if you look down the rest of the list, you'll see a lot of other components that are routinely included in a reserve study, okay? Now, I know the statute has that definition of anything else over $10,000, but the problem is that most associations are, you know, not aware of how much things cost. Uh, so just to give you some idea for your own uh, experience, uh, 
for a smaller, simpler, you know, townhome style community, there might be 15 or 20 components on our list on average. But if you're in a luxury high rise or any sort of complicated property, it's, it's not at all uncommon that that list goes up to 50, 75, even 100 components. All right, so that was our first outcome from the reserve study. We'll move on to the second one now, which is this, this idea of an evaluation of current reserve fund strength, which is often described in terms of percent funded. One of the best ways that, that I found to explain percent funded is using the analogy of a credit score. Okay, now we've all had our credit reports pulled. You should have some general idea of what your credit score is. And to an outside party, like a bank or a credit card company, your credit score is an indicator of what kind of risk you are. So in the same way, if you think of the reserve study itself, like a credit report, and you were to have to distill it down to one key number, one key result, I think that should be percent funded. Now we measure this on a zero to 100% scale. And on that scale, we consider anything between zero and 30% funded to be a weak position. In that range, associations will have a much higher likelihood of special assessments and other types of cash flow problems. Once you get above 30% funded, now you're in a fair range where the risk is more moderate, but where you really wanna be is above 70% funded. That's where we've seen the lowest statistical risk of those types of financial problems occurring. Okay, so we've, we've kind of now talked about percent funded conceptually. I wanna talk you through some examples of how to actually calculate it. Now, the idea is pretty simple. All we're really doing here is looking at how much money an association has at some point in time and then comparing that amount against how much money it should have at the same point in time, expressing that relationship as a percentage, okay? So the first part of the calculation, pretty straightforward. Uh, when we're doing a reserve study, we're gonna look at the current financial statements and trying to look ahead to the start of the next fiscal year in order to know how much money will that community have going into the next fiscal year. You know, obviously we're always budgeting in advance, so, you know, as of right now, we're doing all of our studies typically for the 2022 fiscal year, hoping to understand how much money a community will have January 1st, 2022. The next step is to compare that amount against how much money they should have. Now, this notion, this concept of how much they should have, that is an amount that we refer to as the fully funded balance. Now, I want to make this clear. The fully funded balance is a theoretical number. And the way I like to put this in perspective is to ask you guys a question, right? So if I were to tell you that an association has $50,000 in reserves, but I haven't told you anything else about the community, does that matter? Have I really told you anything at all? And the reason I point this out is because I hear this kind of thing all the time from board members. Some of you managers out there might be, you know, nodding your heads along with me. Someone might say, you know, our association's in great shape. We have, you know, $900,000 in our reserve account. But unless we know what we're comparing it against, I have no way of knowing if $900,000 is a lot of money or not for that particular community. So, you know, it, you can imagine it all depends on what type of property we're talking about. If I'm working with a little two-story building, no amenities, just a parking lot, it could be that $50,000 is plenty of money for that property. But if we're looking at a luxury high-rise building, we know that $50,000 is gonna be a drop in the bucket, right? That could be one payment of one project and that's it. So we'll take this one step further, talking about how do we actually calculate this number, this fully funded balance, which is a pretty simple idea. Uh, we'll just need to look at how old the component is compared to its overall lifespan, which gives us a fraction. We then multiply that fraction by the current estimated cost of the component which tells us how much money we should have today for its eventual replacement. So when we do a reserve study, it actually doesn't matter if the association has four components or 400, we're gonna calculate that fully funded balance for each individual one, and then add all those numbers together, which tells us the fully funded balance for the entire community. Once we've done that, now we have something we can use to look at their actual cash on hand and put that number in perspective. So to really hammer this home, we're gonna do this quick example together. Let's all pretend that we are running this property called Seaview Condominiums. And if we wanna calculate percent funded for the association, this is how we would do that. Um, you know, the, we, know, know, we know now that the first thing we have to do is establish the starting reserve balance for the upcoming fiscal year. So, you know, pardon the typo, let's say that says 2022. 
Uh, let's say that we've reviewed our financial statements, we've taken into account any projected spending for this year, and we know how much we're going to put into the reserve account for the rest of this year. And let's say we've done that math and it leaves us with a starting position of $60,000 on that date. The next thing we need to do is to calculate the fully funded balance for all the components. And for the sake of this example, we'll just limit it to three things. First, we'll look at the roof, okay? Let's say that the roof is 10 years old with an overall useful life of 20 years, and let's give it an estimated replacement cost of $80,000. Now, keep in mind that the fully funded balance is only the proportion of the cost that we need to have on hand today. So since the roof is halfway through its life, you could argue that you only need to have half of the replacement cost saved up today, recognizing you've got another 10 years to collect the difference. So in this case, we'll take 10 over 20, multiply that by 80,000, which tells us that the theoretical fully funded balance for our roof right now is $40,000, okay? It's halfway through its life. We should have half of the replacement cost saved up. Next up, we'll look at the gym equipment. Now, if we assume that the gym equipment is five years old with an overall life expectancy of let's say 15 years and a replacement cost of 30 grand, we should know that the fully funded balance for that gym equipment right now should be $10,000, which makes sense. It's only a third of the way through its life. So proportionally, you only need to have a third of the replacement cost on hand in the bank. Let's do one more. Let's say that now we're talking about painting the hallways of the building. Okay, we did it two years ago, two years old, and we wanna do that project every eight years. Let's say the cost estimate is $100,000. You would divide two by eight, so it's one fourth or 25% of the way through its life. And if we assume the cost estimate is $100,000, we now know that the fully funded balance for hallway painting is 25 grand. Okay, so again, now that we know the starting reserve balance and we have calculated the individual fully funded balances for each component, we're now able to determine percent funded as a whole. If we take the three numbers we just calculated, we can add those together. So you'll take your 40,000 for the roof, your 10,000 for the gym equipment and 25,000 for painting. Added together, the total theoretical fully funded balance is 75,000. Now we can look back at our 60,000 that was actually cash in hand and make a call that this community is 80% funded. Okay, before we move on from this section, I just wanna talk about how we draw some financial conclusions here, you know, based on these levels of percent funded. What you're looking at on this chart is the result of a very large internal analysis that we completed a number of years ago. This was looking at a data set of thousands of associations across the country and measuring for two variables. First, what was their percent funded level? You know, what, where were they at today? And secondly, as part of their funding plan, did we need to include any special assessments? Was there an immediate need for cash? Now the results obviously were, were in line with what we would have expected. In short, the closer the association is to 0% funded, the more frequent the need for immediate special assessments. And the nice thing is that you see that risk dropping very dramatically, even when a community is about 40% funded, it was only a 10% instance that we were recommending those immediate special assessments. A few years later, we did one more study internally, this time looking at the correlation between percent funded and actual property value uh, for homes in a, in a given community. The way we did this one was to look at a data set from a large metropolitan area, kind of greater Los Angeles, California. And this time we selected a group of properties, I think it was about 200 properties, that were all as similar as they could be in terms of size and age and amenities and so forth. Uh, we then measured the appraised market value of the homes in those communities. And we wanted to see what difference did it make when the associations themselves were in a better financial position. So to be specific, what type of increase in value would we see when an association was in a better financial position with respect to percent funded? So the first thing we did was to set a baseline. Okay, so if we, if we set the baseline as communities that were in a, a weak position, zero to 30% funded, and then wanting to know what happens when comparable associations were in a fair position between 30 and 70% funded, what we saw was about an 8% gain in property value. Okay, dollars per square foot, you know, all else being as equal as possible, communities that were in a fair position were about 8% more valuable than those in a weak position. 
And then interestingly, when we looked at the really strong communities, uh, the ones that were above 70%, that gain was about 13%. Um, and now intuitively, you might kind of figure out how that would be the case. Uh, the associations that have money in the bank tend to have better curb appeal, right? They're in better physical condition. They have the ability to upgrade their amenities more frequently to take advantage of newer technology. Um, and so that all of that adds up to those being more attractive to potential buyers, creating more demand for those units and therefore a higher price point. So if you go back to that very first question we asked, why have reserves? Uh, you know, this is one of the arguments. It, it can actually come back to you in the form of higher property value. Okay, our third and final outcome that you get from a reserve study is called your funding plan. Uh, now, if you think of the first two things we talked about, the component list, that tells us what we're reserving for. We talked about percent funded, which tells us where a community stands as of a particular point in time. Now the question is, and, and what we get from our third outcome here is where do we go from here? Now, one of the first things that we do when we're designing these funding plans is to look at an association's current budget. You know, what happens if they just stick with the plan they've been on, if they just continue to contribute as they have, what would that do over time given their future expenditures? Now, if it's clear that that existing plan is not sufficient, then obviously they'll have to make some changes. Um, Two of the other points I like to make here are that the funding of reserves needs to be consistent with the timing of your overall assessments. For example, if you have monthly dues payable to your association, there needs to be a monthly reserve contribution. I believe by law that has to be within 30 days. In other words, what you cannot do is just operate throughout the year, hoping that at the end of the year, you'll have some kind of surplus in your operating budget, which you can then transfer into reserves and say, hey, we funded our reserves this year. It doesn't work that way. It has to be a proactive plan. And the last point on this particular slide is that in those cases where the historical contribution rate has not been sufficient and an association is in bad shape, then unfortunately there might need to be an initial special assessment that is included as part of that plan. When this happens in those cases, it is absolutely appropriate to think of that special assessment like a catch-up contribution. It's being made for all the years when the funding was not sufficient. Okay, there's another set of principles that come into play here when we're talking about funding plans, and I'll talk about these individually, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll bring this to a close here in just a few minutes. First and foremost, as you look at your future and you model your reserve expenses over time, at the bare minimum, the amount of money that you put into reserves over that period of time needs to ensure that you have some cash on hand. That's the bare minimum requirement. It's something that's called baseline funding, which we're gonna talk about in our next class next week. But obviously, if you don't have any money in reserves, you're essentially guaranteed to have special assessments and loans to pay for projects, which is hopefully one of the things we're trying to avoid in the first place. The contribution rate to reserves also needs to be stable. So what that means is that, for example, you can't have big, huge spikes and decreases into your reserve contributions over time based on arbitrary fluctuations. Okay, it's, it's not fair to assume that some future group of owners will be perfectly willing and able to double their reserve contributions from one year to the next, which would make it a whole lot easier on the owners who live there today. Okay, you're also not allowed to plug in any balloon contributions. Okay, if you've got a million dollar roof replacement project, which is scheduled for 10 years from now, it's not okay in the present day to keep your reserves very low, assuming that in that ninth year, right before the roof project comes along, you can just raise $950,000 and therefore avoid putting away any money between now and then. You also don't take years off. So for example, let's say you've just spent a huge amount of money modernizing your elevators. I'm sure some of you have, out there have been through this. You may not have to do that again for another 20 or 25 years, but that does not mean that you stop funding your reserves for elevator modernization. That's not a once in a lifetime project. It happens again, and you should begin funding for the next time around as early as possible so as to spread the cost of that project over the longest period of time that you can. The idea is that the association membership should be paying for the deterioration of components over their entire useful life, not just all at once right when something fails. That way everybody pays their fair share and it's not just the unlucky people who happen to live in a property when some component fails uh, and they get stuck with the whole bill. That's like playing musical chairs and you're not allowed to do that. 
Okay. This is our last slide before we'll go to Q&A, um, but I want to make a couple of good points here. The, the most important principle to follow when you're designing these reserve funding plans is that it's got to be fiscally responsible. So what do we mean by that? That means being realistic with respect to interest and inflation. Okay, it's not realistic to assume that, to assume that you can earn 10% interest each year on your invested reserve funds. We all know that that reserve money really can't be invested in anything very exciting. So you should be factoring in a fairly low return on those funds. With respect to inflation, uh, and this has become a more complicated topic in the last couple of years, but you should also be being realistic there too. What we found through historical data is that over a long enough period of time, the average one year to the next average annual inflation rate tends to be about 3%. So if you are assuming that the cost of a project 15 years from now will be the same as what it costs today, you're likely to be way off. That plan's just not gonna work. The second point on this slide speaks to being honest about the situation that you're in. Okay, if your association has not historically done a good job of funding reserves, it's critical to address that. Okay, it's just plain financially irresponsible to continue operating the way you always have, just to try and maintain some, some kind of status quo. Okay, it's not the job of the board of directors to make owners happy. It is not their job to keep the dues low compared to the building next door. Speaking of those owners, the reserve funding plan cannot be biased in favor of the people who live there now at the expense of the people who will live there later on. You know, I've made this point a couple of times and I just want to reiterate that. You can't assume that they'll pay the tab for you. Um, now, lastly, this all takes place despite what may have happened up to now. And of course, we see this all the time. Prior budgets weren't funding reserves and associations that are here today have had the can kicked to them. That's not an excuse to kick the can on down the road for the next group of people. In a perfect world, all associations would have been carefully managed and guided over the years to some stable financial position, but we know in reality that's usually not the case. Um, I wanna make it clear though, that does not in any way remove the obligation from the board of directors to act responsibly, fulfill that fiduciary duty. Having said all that, at the end of the day, we of course recognize this is a challenge for most communities. If you've got an association that's been operating for many years without funding its reserves properly, there's a really good chance they'll be in a financial hole that might be tough to climb out of. But we can't minimize that, okay? The owners in the communities deserve to make an informed decision. Uh, we think that having a reserve study done is a great way to help with that. They need to know whether it's being done by a third party or not, that if your reserves are not being funded properly, the only logical conclusion will be special assessments and loans when things need to get done. Um, just to make one last point with respect to Surfside, um, you know, to the Champlain Towers building, it's now come out in the news, they had been denied for a couple of loans, uh, or I should say denied by a couple of different banks for a loan to pay for their projects. So that loan option that historically has, you know, always been pretty attainable for most communities, uh, in light of what's happened, you know, that may not be a, a viable option for certain communities anymore. So it's, it's special assessments or, you know, the, com the community continues to fall in disrepair and, and that has a downward effect on property value. Okay, so to uh, close this out, I want you to remember the guy that we saw in the beginning, right? The guy with his eyes closed, the fingers crossed, you know, his attitude of just kind of hoping for the best. If I've done anything here today, I hope you'll agree that that mindset is not a substitute for any sort of financial plan, right? A responsible financial plan. Um, so I wanna thank everybody again for joining today. We're gonna to open this up to Q and A and uh, we'll take it from here. So I will uh, turn my screen back on. Ashley and Evan, if you guys wanna jump in, I see that we've got a lot of questions already in the chat here. Um, I'll put my uh, email address here up on the screen in case we don't get through all these, but Let's uh, let's get started. Evan, do we have any good good ones you want to tackle first? Uh, let's see here. Uh, there's a bunch of questions about how do you determine what's an operating expense versus a uh, reserve expense, and you want to clarify that a little bit? Sure. Yeah, and, and there's certainly certain things that can fall into kind of a gray area, uh, but I think the the clearest definition is if it happens on an annual basis and is fairly consistent in terms of cost from one year to the next, that should be an operating expense. So for most communities, 
you know, landscaping is a classic example. That's a big, huge number. It's very expensive to maintain the landscaping in a lot of these communities, um, but it's routine. It's consistent from one year to the next. And if that's the case, it should most likely be in the operating budget. Uh, I think you and I have actually discussed this, the, uh, the DBPR and what is their position on inflation assumptions and balloon payments? <laughs> Great question. Um, that one I'm gonna I'll give a try to give a short answer, but that we go into great detail on in next week's class, uh, the reserve funding methodologies class. But basically, the issue that has come up in recent years is that there's a one sentence in Florida Administrative Code that says a pooled reserve funding plan may not allow for any balloon payments, and the working interpretation that has been communicated to us in the industry is that any increase from one year to the next in a proposed contribution rate constitutes a balloon payment. Now, personally, I, I totally disagree with that interpretation. Uh, every CPA I've ever asked uh, has disagreed with that, um, but I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Um, we're gonna talk a lot more about that in the, in the second class next week. Uh, someone asks, what uh, questions or documentation can an owner ask for to find out if the condominium is properly or uh, effectively being managed from a financial standpoint? I mean, I can answer that one. I mean, you know, yeah, you I was going to say, I'd love to hear your answer on that. No, I, I highly recommend getting a copy of uh, the most recent, you know, closed out financial statement. Um, you know, that's considered an interim financial statement. I would ask for a copy of the audit uh, that they're required to have. So you get the most recent completed audit to make sure um, that they're doing that. I would ask for a copy of a reserve study if one exists. Um, if one doesn't exist, that might tell you something right there. Um, you know, obviously this depends on the type of building, age, construction, all that. Um, but these are absolutely things you should be asking for. I always ask for a copy of the documents, including the rules and regulations. Um, and you could even ask for copies of the, uh, the minutes of the board meetings from the past 12 months so you can get an idea of what's being discussed at the board meetings. Uh, yeah. You really cannot do too much homework, uh, particularly when you're purchasing a, a condominium unit. But you know, this can go for HOAs too. There's some HOAs out there that have uh, some some huge reserve expenditures on the horizon, and you know the, they can hit you in a single family home similar to uh, to a condo. So, regard whenever you're buying in a yeah. planned unit community, I recommend getting all those documents. Yeah. And, and one thing you mentioned, the audited financial statements, make sure that you read the notes to those statements. Because when I talk to CPAs, that's where they say, you know, if something doesn't really fit in the tables and the kind of required disclosures, the notes will often give a lot more, you know, color commentary or background as to how they arrived at those numbers. So quite often, if they're dealing with a community that has not had a formal reserve study done, if it's just the board that's putting together the schedule, oftentimes they will have a recommendation in there somewhere or some other other, you know, clarifying information that, that might be, uh, you know, very important to know as well. All right. All right. Uh, so what else do we have here? Some comments there. Is there a legal, I guess, is there a legal impediment to having a, res a reserve account um, for an insurance deductible? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you can create a reserve account for an insurance deductible. It's not that it's illegal to do so. Uh, and in particular for associations that are using the straight line method of reserve funding where particular funds are dedicated to particular projects, it, it's a little bit simpler to have one that's designated specifically for that insurance deductible. But everything I said in the class still applies. You're still making a, a random guess as to what the life expectancy should be for that and figuring out, you know, when would we ever need to pay this? That's anybody's guess. Um, I'm a bigger fan of having an emergency line of credit that's available and possibly starting to sock away money. If you do have a uh, surplus at the end of the year, maybe park some of that money into a emergency fund, which can be used for paying the deductible or, or you know, defending a lawsuit against the community, any other sort of unforeseen expense. Yeah, I tend to agree with you. I mean, because you just, the unpredictable nature of hurricanes, why should someone who lives there now put the deductible money away um, when somebody else may, may benefit from it? I mean, you're all using the elevator and the roof today. You're all getting the benefit of that. Um, so you should pay as that kind of degrades over time. That's kind of the concept of reserves, but uh, you're not getting, to get the benefit of hurricane-free years or, or, you know, 
that doesn't seem fair to me. So I think the people right. who are living there when the un, you know the unforeseen event occurs really should be the ones to to pay for it. But at the same, you know, obviously yeah. keeping schools a thought there. So well, and there, quite frankly, there there is a time and a place where a special assessment is the correct response. You know, nobody likes it. It's not fun, but you know, it's not anybody's fault when a real surprise comes along and you have to pay for it. That is just, you know, the nature of. Uh, living in a home, whether it's in a community association or if you have a single family home, if a tornado or a hurricane comes and rips your roof off, you know, it might have been a brand new roof, but you know, guess what? Now you've got to pay your insurance deductible and, you know, right. that may come as a surprise. That's that's why, you know, you need to have, you know, a responsible financial plan in place. Can funds from one reserve category like elevator be used for another like roof? I think you addressed that, but the answer is if you're in the straight line, method uh, no that's not allowed unless you get a vote of the owners if you're in the pool method then the answer is pretty much is basically yes but the yeah. pool method is more complicated than the straight line method yeah and we'll talk a lot about that in next week's class as well i'll mm -hmm. give some examples there um let's see i'm, I'm going to pick off the list there's a couple that jump out to me here um one person asked, I've always thought of reserve studies as an accounting exercise. In light of recent events, it seems an engineering study should be part of the product. Is this going to become more common? Um, I, I really want to emphasize they are two different things. You know, a reserve study, again, is, is meant to be broad and comprehensive and based on recurring predictable life cycles for normal projects. Um, an engineering study is laser focused and um, very important to do if there are potential concerns for the structure, for your life safety systems, for your electrical systems. You know, I think we're all, you know, uh, aware now of what the 40 year certification requirements are for Dade and Broward County. I can see that that might be um, expanded to the entire state at some point, or uh, they may shorten up the time horizon there. Maybe buildings will start needing to do that at 20 years. I definitely think it's going to be more common that buildings will be uh, taking account of these things from an engineering standpoint and an accounting standpoint, uh, but they really are two separate engagements by two, two different types of companies. So there's some questions about um, some of these reserve studies basically do include items that may be below the $10,000 threshold, but they find them in the reserve study, you know, pumps and HVAC units that may be five, $7,000. And, and I do see those as well. So uh, people are saying, does that have to be in there or, um, or why do you put that in there? Yeah. I mean, legally the number is $10,000. Um, and if a client really wants us to go to the letter of the law and exclude anything below $10,000, we will do that. But we have, we do so with a disclaimer saying that, okay, these things still exist and they will still happen. So whether or not you list it as a reserve component, um, well, I should say, if you're not going to list it as a reserve component, you should absolutely have some money parked aside in your operating account for paying for that thing, because it's, you know, it's going to happen. And especially if a bunch of little things all happen at the same time, that's where you see these small to medium sized associations getting into a bit of financial distress over that. Right, right. And, and there's no law against including an item under 10,000. So I think people need to be, yeah. you're absolutely allowed to include it, which is, and, and I agree with you. I think when you have those type of things, it, it's good because people forget and then all of a sudden they have a $9,000 item that wasn't in the operating budget uh, because it only happens once every seven or eight years. So mm -hmm. I think it's good to have that stuff in there. Yeah. Um, just so everybody knows, we've got about 78 open questions here. So I, I don't think we're going to be able to get through everything. Um, I, I can stay on for another, you know, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, but a lot of the questions I think people are asking will be addressed in the, um, in the next class. And, and for those that are, kind of uh, specific to your particular community's situation, uh, better to send those by email or give us a call and, and we can try to help you out. Um, let's see, uh, Evan, you see any other good ones that jump out at you? Um, some people are asking about how do you determine life expectancy? I think that's an important one because th there is a little bit of, mm -hmm. it's an interesting topic. <laughs> Yeah, so first and foremost, the useful life expectancy you plug into a reserve study can uh, depend on what we call the failure mode of that component, okay? So certain things are purely objective. Think of something like an air conditioner or a pool heater where nobody cares what it looks like, it just has a job to do. And so in that case, the useful life is gonna be based on you know, how long it can perform in its installed environment, assuming good preventive maintenance, you know, based on when it was originally installed and, and so forth. 
the opposite end of the spectrum might be something like the furniture in a lobby, right? It has almost no job to do except to look good and provide good curb appeal. So in that case, it's a more subjective decision. You know, how often do tastes change? You know, I would say it's not every five years, but it's not every 50 years. It's maybe a 15 or 20 year, you know, kind of a generational turnover sort of approach. Um, so the short answer is that it really depends on the component, um, but absolutely a good reserve study should be tailoring its recommendations to the that particular property. If you have a building on the coast, the useful life of your components is not going to be as long as if it were inland. You know, uh, you might have to do more frequent painting and waterproofing. You might have to change out your mechanical equipment more frequently. Uh, so you want to make sure that whatever numbers you're using are unique and tailored to that particular scenario. Here's a good one. And if an association has no reserve funds and wants to start one, can they work to a fully funded position over a number of years rather than one enormous assessment? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, you, you don't need to just try to get it all back in one shot. Something is always yeah. better than nothing. And as a management company, we, we strongly recommend doing whatever you can to set some money aside. Um, more is better, but you know, something's better than nothing. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, when we um, when we design a funding plan for a client, if the goal is to become fully funded, meaning 100% funded, that's the goal for the the length of the plan. So by the end of 30 years, they should get there. As long as they're constantly improving their position and further reducing the risk of special assessments, that's the goal. Uh, so if you're starting from a very weak position, you know, zero to 10% funded, it might require some special assessments for your, your most immediate projects, the ones that are coming up quickly. But beyond that, um, you know, it's more of a gradual increase. We would never hammer a community to say, you've got to go from zero to 100% funded in three years or else. It's, it's, that would be an unfair burden to impose on them. Hmm. Let's see what else we have here. This is a really common misconception, so maybe we should address this. I've heard this a bunch. Is 10% of the budget an okay number or estimate for reserves? I don't know where that comes from, but that myth seems yeah. to be out there. I can tell you where that comes from. So that came, around, came about as, as of um, 2008, 2009, when we had the big real estate market crash. Uh, mm -hmm. At that time, the government started imposing more restrictions for government backed loans, right? So if somebody wants to come in with a low down payment, putting in, you know, 3%, 5% down on a, on a community, um, that's obviously a riskier situation. And so if they want to do that in an association, the re minimum requirement to qualify the association for those types of loans, uh, there's a laundry list of things they have to do, but one of them is they have to show that at least 10% of the annual budget is going to reserves mm -hmm. unless they have a current credible reserve study that justifies a lower number. Okay. Now I'm going to tell you guys right now that 10% of the budget is almost never, ever enough. Uh, what we have found is that communities that are doing this right, that are in a strong position, that don't have a big history of special assessments, they tend to contribute between 15 and 40% of their annual budget to reserves. So this is not an afterthought. It's not like, just, you know, if we have some extra money at the end of the year, we'll put that in reserves. No, this should be maybe the biggest line item or second biggest line item in your annual budget. Uh, the 10% thing is, is a very arbitrary number. And um, when people call me to ask if, you know, if they're going to satisfy that requirement by having a reserve study done, I just tell them, I can do a study for you, but the chances we show that less than 10% is sufficient are almost zero. So, yeah. See here. Uh, do you see, there's a lot of legal questions in here, so I apologize. We <laughs> can't answer the questions. Are this legal? I know a lot of you uh, have asked stuff like that, so that's why we're we're jumping over some of those. Yeah, um, a bunch and a bunch of people asking about the difference between straight line and pooled. Which again, you know, not to to uh, to be redundant, but we're going to have almost the entire content of the next course will be on that subject. So uh, tune in next week if you can, or or be sure to catch up with that recording. Um, let's see, um, uh, you know, there, there's a couple of questions I've, I've seen here, which are kind of, uh, you know, uh, centering around this mentality, right? You know, our, our owners are claiming they're on fixed incomes. They don't want to raise in their quarterly fees. What's our strategy for responding to this or addressing this? Um, Evan, do you have any thoughts on that? I certainly have a lot to say about that, but from a management perspective, how would you guys respond to that? <laughs> 
I'm sorry. What was the question again? Just getting around this mentality of, of owners saying, hey, we're on fixed incomes. We can't take any additional increase to our fees. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, the board has a fiduciary responsibility to the community as a whole and, and not to the members with the least ability to pay. I, I typically, I hear that, but then in practice, I find that not to be true. That's typically a small minority, a very, typically a very small minority of people. And unfortunately, the board can't govern the entire community to cater to the people with the least ability to pay. You, you have to maintain the facilities for everyone who lives there. And, um, and if they did do that, you know, if they always were catering to the lowest common denominator, uh, you know, the building could fall into disrepair at, and then at the detriment to all the other owners. So they need yeah. to take the entire building and the entire membership into account when they're passing a budget or looking at reserves is the way I look at it. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think you need to communicate to people, this is the true cost of ownership of living in an association, you know, and it may not be right for everybody. I'm, you know, my heart goes out to people that are on a fixed income who, who can't pay their bills. Uh, I personally, that's a tough situation to be in. But professionally, and the board's obligation, as I think you said, well, is to act on behalf of the corporation of the association itself, not to cater to anybody. So, um, not only that, but it's not like if you don't raise your fees that all these costs go away, right? So you will either pay for these things in the form of, you know, a higher budget with appropriate reserve contributions or loans and special assessments, right? Which might be even more, uh, you know, more of an issue financially for certain people to pay. Um, now, if you can't do any of those three, then yeah, your property falls into disrepair and you all pay for it in the sense that you have declining property values too. So there is no option to not pay. Um, and, you know, the, the best option is to have a healthy reserve fund. You know, again, we're sensitive to communities that haven't done that historically, but it is what it is. I mean, if, if you're in a hole, stop digging. Uh, let's see. I think maybe we can do a couple more questions. Um, I'm going to try to pick out any general ones that might be good for the group. I uh, appreciate all you guys staying on, by the way. We still have 327 people on the line, uh, which is great. Uh, let's just see if there's any others. Uh, quick question. Somebody's asking, when will the invites for the next session go out? I think that that's going to be Ashley emailing those probably within the next couple of days. Um, let's see. There are some questions about costs in here. Will, can you kind of give a, I know that there's, you can't give a quote, but kind of a range, a ballpark figure so people can get a sense for the uh, you know, rough estimate of what it would cost to, to get a for, full for a reserve study. Yeah, sure. So um, again, there there are multiple types of reserve studies. So if you've never had one done before, if you're doing a full reserve study, totally from scratch, the most comprehensive, the most uh, time intensive process, you know, it, it's it is rough to give a specific number, but I'll give you a range. So for a smaller, simpler, you know, condo association, townhome style property, maybe with just, you know, some parking areas and a small pool and a small clubhouse. Um, if it's in South Florida and there's not a lot of travel expense uh, for the provider, you know, you may be in the three, three thousand, thirty five hundred dollar range. If you've got a, you know, 65 story luxury high rise down in Brickell or in Palm Beach or downtown Miami, that can be seven, eight thousand dollars. I mean, there's a much, much more uh, time that goes into doing a reserve study for a property like that. Um, so it depends. I mean, there are uh, certain advantages at certain times of the year. You know, right now, as most communities are starting their budget process, I'm sure that every reserve study provider in the country or in the, certainly in the state um, is, is very busy right now. Um, you know, I can only speak for our company, but we tend to have a little bit more advantageous pricing in the early part of the year, you know, for communities that might want to um, start in the first quarter, let's say, and, and uh, get a jump on their budgeting process. So you know, it really depends. Uh, proposals are easy to do, though. If you'd like to get a proposal for your community, um, you can visit reservestudy.com. We've got a tool right there on our homepage where you can submit your information, uh, and that'll come right to us. And uh, we usually respond to those within a couple of days. So, um, well, I think we're both kind of up against it here. It's one fifteen. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's unfortunate we couldn't get to all ninety-two questions that are still open, but uh, I think we covered a lot of it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you again. Uh, looks like Ashley just launched the, uh, the survey. So hopefully everybody can, uh, can see that now and,
we definitely appreciate your feedback there. Yeah. So thank you, everybody. Appreciate you guys joining us today. We had uh, we had quite a few people on and uh, stayed through the Q&A, which was great. Uh, as Will stated, he's going to be hosting another course uh, next week. And so please do sign up for that. Uh, a lot of you who may un have understood the basics will really be able to take advantage of that second course based on some of the questions I saw in there. So do sign up for that and uh, have a great afternoon. Will, anything before we go? Now, Evan, thanks again. Thanks, Ashley. And uh, look forward to chatting again with everybody next week. So uh, for the managers out there, um, as soon as we get all your license information, we'll be submitting that uh, uh, credit to the state. So you'll be getting certificates and getting a credit for today's course. Uh, next week's is also good for an hour of uh, IFM credit. So hope to uh, see as many of you as possible. Thank you again. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Take care.